This series of videos was developed as part of the First Presbyterian Church of Norwalk's confirmation class. We are glad you are here. You are not alone on the journey of faith. Jesus said, Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. John 14, 27. Today's topic, the sacraments. Part 1, the Word of God enacted. For Christians, we believe that God's Word has power and authority. When God speaks, we believe that things happen. For example, all the way back in Genesis, God creates the universe by speaking. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Even later, God appointed prophets to speak God's word to others, and God's word had authority. Thus says the Lord, Act with justice and righteousness, and deliver from the hand of the oppressor anyone who has been robbed, and do no wrong or violence to the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 3. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus himself is identified as the Word of God in human form. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. Now we as Christians believe that Jesus is the Word of God in flesh. Now the Bible, as you recall, is inspired by God. It records the words of God, the stories of God's actions in history, and attests to Jesus Christ as Savior and God. As a result, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, written. Finally, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave instructions to his disciples to take certain actions. He told his disciples to baptize. He told them to share the bread and the cup. Now, churches call these actions sacraments or ordinances. A sacrament is something sacred, holy, and a set apart for God. An ordinance is something that is ordered or commanded by Jesus. Together, we sometimes call them the Word of God enacted. In summary, Jesus is the Word of God in flesh. The Bible is the Word of God written. The sacraments, namely baptism and communion, are the Word of God enacted. Part 2. Baptism. Now, whether someone has been baptized as an infant or youth or as an adult, it's an experience that all Presbyterians share. In fact, it's an experience that almost all Christians share. At a baptism, we remind ourselves of God's story and we ask that God make this person a part of that wonderful story. The water of baptism reminds us of new beginnings, like the story of Noah and the world cleansed after the waters of the flood. It reminds us of God's rescue, like the Hebrew children being rescued from Pharaoh in the parting of the Red Sea. It reminds us of God's covenant as the Jewish people cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus is baptized by his cousin John. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. In that baptism, Jesus identifies with us and our sin, and through our baptism, we are reminded that God washes our sins away because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. As Christ identified with us, we identify with him. In our baptisms, through that true Son of God, we become part of God's family. The church believes that baptizing others is part of our calling. We, in the name of Jesus Christ, welcome others into God's family. After he had risen victorious from the grave, Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. In our tradition, we baptize people of all ages, including infants. Our Lord, Jesus Christ, received the children when they were presented to him. Jesus said to his disciples, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Mark chapter 10 verses 14 through 15. In the life of the church, the baptism of a child, a youth, or an adult is always a celebration. It's a sign that God's family is growing. It points to the reality that God's story continues. Our baptisms are an entry into the life of discipleship. 
That invitation is given to us every day as to whether or not we will live the promises made at those baptisms. Part 3, The Lord's Supper. Now, eating and drinking were an important part of Jesus' ministry. His first miracle was turning water into wine at a wedding feast. The religious leaders criticized Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus fed the thousands with just a few loaves and fish. After the resurrection, he made a breakfast of fish for his disciples. People recognized Jesus as the risen Savior in the breaking of the bread. Of course, the Jewish people understood the power of food. The most important religious ritual of the Jews was a meal, the Passover Seder. Jesus, on the night of his arrest, was celebrating the Passover with his disciples, and there he gave his followers a reminder of what Jesus would accomplish by his suffering on the cross. <laughs> While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. common terms with which we call this meal. The first is obvious, the Lord's Supper. This is the meal that Jesus commanded us to share. In the meal, we remember what Jesus did for us. We remember creation, our need for redemption, and Jesus' broken body and shed blood. The second term is Eucharist. Now, Eucharist is a Greek word meaning thanksgiving. We recount all the things for which we're thankful. We give thanks to God for everything, including the grace that God has given us in Jesus Christ. The third term is Holy Communion. Communion has the same root word as community. Just like friends and family might share a meal as a result of their relationship, Jesus welcomes us to the table to demonstrate that we have a relationship with God and with one another. God, through the Holy Spirit, uses this meal to strengthen the bonds that we have with one another. When we share the bread and the cup, we remember, we give thanks, we share, and finally, we anticipate the future that God has prepared. The Bible talks about the coming kingdom of heaven as a party and a feast. Our time sharing the Lord's Supper should be a joyous occasion in the life of the church. Throughout Christian history, there have been disagreements and fights over the nature of the Lord's Supper. Technical difficulties aside, Presbyterians believe that like sun, soil, and water help plants to grow, the Lord's Supper is one of the ordinary ways that God helps us to grow in faith.